Okay, thank you for the introduction, and I want to say thank you also to the conference organizers for putting uh, this conference together. So my talk is entitled, Identity and Resistance in the British Colonial Narrative. What renders the natural history of St. Vincent more interesting and curious than that of any other West India island, and probably maybe the means of hereafter of employing the pens of philosophers and politicians, is its being long the residence of a singular tribe of men nowhere else known, the black Caribs, whose history, manner of gaining possession of greater part of the country, modes of life and manners are at this time but little known in Great Britain. So wrote Alexander Anderson, who was the director of the Botanical Garden on St. Vincent, when native resistance culminated in the war lasting from 1795 to 1797. That we're all gathered to discuss the history and moods of indigenous resistance makes Anderson's statement all the more prescient. Whatever Anderson might have imagined those philosophical and political conversations to consist of, he was correct in predicting that native resistance to British colonialism would play a central role in political discourse for years to come. Recently in St. Vincent, the history of indigenous resistance has been at the center of debates about citizenship, reparations, and national identity. A watershed moment came in 2002 when Joseph Chatier, the Carib chief, who led the insurrection against the British in 1772 and 1795, was declared a national hero. Dr. Adrian Fraser has placed this renewed interest in Chatier and his legacy within a broader project of constructing a national his nationalist history in St. Vincent. Chatier's heroic exploits and sacrifice, he suggests, would offer lessons for St. Vincent's independence. It is this notion of national identity that I would like to reflect on in my talk today. Benedict Anderson, who writes on political theory, has written about the emergence of European nationalism, and he defines the nation as an imagined political community. It's imagined, he says, that the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of people, lives the image of their community. People of a nation have a shared, a shared images or symbols that bind them together. These symbols might be national heroes, a hero of the past, that reflect a shared identity and unite them in spite of differences. If we accept Anderson's notion of nationness, what is this image or symbol of communion that draws Vincentians together? And what does that symbol reveal about the way Vincentians conceive of their identity? In the first part of my talk, I will discuss how the colonial discourses, such as Alexander Anderson's Natural History and William Young's account of the Black Caribs, bear out the legacy of indigenous resistance that has become so central to notions of identity for St. Vincent. I'm interested in how these narratives are appropriated for the construction of a national identity. Although the beginning of my talk will center on these discourses of resistance in Anderson and Young's work, I would also like to take some time to reflect on the relation between resistance and national identity. Although hostile to the presence of indigenous people on St. Vincent, colonial narratives such as William Young's account of the Black Caribs bear out the legacy of Garifuna resistance. In the beginning of his letter, in which William Young argues for the removal of the Caribs from St. Vincent, Young challenges the belief that the Garifuna were the rightful possessors of the island by drawing attention to a well-established narrative about their origin. And of course, we'll hear more uh, about that uh, debate later on. Young writes that the Negroes, or black Caribs, as they have been termed as of late, are descendants of uh, the cargo of an African slave ship bound from the Bight of Benin to Barbados and wrecked about 1675 on the coast of Beckley. To legitimize his call for genocide, Young must discount the indigeneity of the black Caribs or the Garifuna. Playing up the African aspects of the hybrid nation, he says, incorporating with these Negro outlaws, they formed a nation now known by the black Caribs a title they themselves arrogated when entering into a contest with their masters. He dismisses the black Carib as a nation overrun by Negroes from a warlike Mocha tribe in Africa, 
And yet, in spite of the obvious aims of the discourse, Young recognizes the Garifuna as a nation who have given themselves a title. Although Young's argument is that the Caribs have claimed an identity without justification, there's the persistent or competing idea of Garifuna self-determination that undermines Young's agenda. Whether or not we choose to accept, accept Young's claims about how the Garifuna came into being, his attention to their ethnogenesis or their origin cements Garifuna identity within a culture of resistance or subversion to colonial hegemony. Although Alexander Anderson, who I mentioned at the outset, in his natural history is less preoccupied with the ethnogenesis of the Caribs, he also repeats the story of the escaped African slaves in his attempt to define the Garifuna nation. An act of providence liberated them from the chains of slavery, he says. After that effect, they long maintained their independence in gratitude and cruelty to their protectors. There are two conflicting discourses in this description of the Caribs. On one hand, Anderson, like Young, emphasizes the African connection and their status as escaped slaves. But on the other hand, what is even more striking is this acknowledgement of the Garifuna's drive for freedom and independence. Indeed, even when colonial writers mean to connect the indigenous people with a history of slavery that in turn justify their dispossession, their own language causes the very idea of the Carib or the Garifuna to be bound up with the competing discourse of independence, freedom, and resistance. More than their ethnogenesis, Anderson is preoccupied with the modes of resistance enacted by the indigenous people of Sydney. Anderson's writing is shaped by 18th century aesthetic theory and colonial desire. And by that, I mean that when Anderson represents the Vincentian landscape, it's desirable because of its capacity to fit into the colonial project, to be subdued, and to be used for the cultivation of sugarcane. Even as Anderson admires the Vincentian landscape and its resources, however, his discourse is repeatedly troubled by the threat of indigenous resistance. Anderson develops what is called a natural history of St. Vincent, a catalog of the flora and fauna of the island. But the resistance of the Caribs disrupt his colonial uh, aesthetic, and the landscape at time takes on the quality of the sublime, of terror. Anderson recounts one incident of resistance at Oia. He says, on this spot was the famous banditti gradatum landed with ammunition for the accomplishment of the diab diabolical plan. Here they accumulated like a snowball, unknown until, like the clouds of locusts of Syria and Egypt, they issued from the forests and thickets, destroying man and beast, reducing to ashes the hard-earned labors of many years and hopes of future ease and quiet. Here the black Caribs are pictured as an invasive and destructive force, reducing to ashes all that is produced by the various technologies of colonialism. Instead of merely inhabiting the discourse, the Caribs transform it. Anderson's gesture to this spot registers a kind of disbelief that the same space can participate in two such diametrically opposed discourses. Here, the Caribs cannot be contained by the unifying imperative of, imperative of colonial discourse. They will not gradually become civilized and attached to the British government, as Anderson hopes. In his representation, the Caribs infiltrate the landscape, progressing in size and strength. The images here are evocative of the sublime affect, forcing Anderson to contemplate the destabilizing force of this resistance. That the Garifuna nation can so thoroughly decimate everything that the British planters had labored to cultivate speaks to the strength of this resistance and its capacity to counter the very discourse that wants to contain it. It's also a moment of ontological crisis, as Anderson recognizes the threat to his very being. When he describes the insurrection of the Caribs in 1795, Anderson again represents the Caribs in terms that point to their capacity for large-scale destruction in the colony. Speaking of the resistance at Dorset Shahill, he writes, here the hordes of banditti uh, from Leeward and Windward united in one numerous body in March 1795 with the determination of the total extirpation of the English inhabitants and spreading universal desolation and rapine throughout the island. And speaking of the Englishmen, he remarks, the thin population of white inhabitants or militia were too small to withstand the swarms of desperados and savages pouring from the woods in all quarters. 
This juxtaposition of a small group of English officers and hordes of caribs is a striking image. Anderson obviously emphasizes the size of the English group in order to explain why the caribs were able to reach, wreak such havoc and destruction in the colony. Once again, the caribs are pictured as hordes and swarms of savages pouring out from the woods. His description threatens to deprive the caribs of their humanity by comparing them to hordes of locusts, and in other places, even Jack Spaniards. But again, the competing discourse of the Caribs' self-determination, affected by their resistance, is evident. The colonial vision, the beautiful landscape whose fertile soil and salubrious air, according to Anderson, made the climate suitable for the cultivation of sugar plantations and the success of the colonial project, is compromised by native resistance. The landscape of St. Vincent itself seems to be rendered complicit in harboring and enabling the resistant Caribs. As Anderson recounts the various occurrences of indigenous resistance on the island, we get a sense of the terror the Caribs must have inspired in the British. At one point, Anderson remarks, the poisoned arrow flew from the, thic from the thicket. Anderson says, the object of its vengeance knew not the quarter from whence it came. So in talking about these poisoned arrows, the force of resistance seems omnipotent and omnipresent. Indeed, everywhere, all powerful. In both Young and Anderson's writings, the discourse of resistance produced by the Garifuna struggle for independence and possession of St. Vincent competes with the colonial imperative. We observe textual moments that escape the systematicity of colonial hegemony. In spite of the violence of the colonial narrative, though, it is still possible to locate native agency within the text. It's not difficult to see why this legacy of resistance is so appealing for a nationalist project in St. Vincent. Rather than the usual narrative of slavery and oppression, the counter-narratives within these texts can offer Vincentians a link to a heroic past. The dreams of the native, as Franz Fanon says, are always of muscular prowess. And this is precisely what these accounts and the legacy of Chatier offers. If Chatier and the Garifuna legacy is at the heart of the construction of Vincentian national identity, then the symbol that unites Vincentians might very well be a legacy of resistance. Still, if we reflect on Benedict Anderson's definition of a nation, we remember that he defines a nation as an imagined community because people who have never met each other and who have differences are encouraged through the use of national symbols to think of themselves as connected, as sharing an identity. As empowering as this discourse of resistance or nationalist project might be, at Benedict Anderson's idea of a nation points to the potential for nationalism to elide deep inequalities within the same community. As he explains, a nation is an imagined community because regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that may prevail in each, the nation is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. Differences in class, educational opportunities, employment, and even the ways in which political connections define the everyday lives of people in St. Vincent can be easily obscured in these conversations that seek to bind Vincentian identity to the discourse of resistance. Caught up in this notion of a heroic past, it might be easy to forget that some people are still struggling for a sense of agency in their own lives, and more broadly speaking, that native people in the Americas continue to struggle to defend their right to exist and to occupy their ancestral lands. On this note, I would like to close by turning to how Anderson depicts the island of Balasso in his narrative. It was on Balasso that the defeated Garifuna were first exiled. Anderson describes a dreadful spectacle of distress and misery. According to his account, the number of people on Balasso numbered 5,200, and nearly one half of them died there. Anthropologists have actually uh, put the number uh, to about 4,195, uh, and only about 1,362 made it to Roatan. Uh, disease, starvation, inadequate food and shelter diminished this proud and free people. Balasso is at once the site of exile and genocide, rebirth and survival.
It serves as a reminder of the colossal sacrifices of the Garifuna in their defense of the right to exist on St. Vincent. Balasso is a summer reminder that the history of the Garifuna is not only about resistance, it is also a story of loss. If it offers a connection to the past, the connection is not just about fortuity, but also about fatality. If there is a lesson to be learned from Balasso, it is about what can happen when cruelty and inhumanity become the official order. But, like the survival of the Garifuna signals, even within the most hostile spaces, there is always the potential for resistance, independence, and